Welcome to Athletes Corner. My name is Nick Strasser, uh, and joined today by one of my mentors, founding boards, psychiatrist, Dr. Hodges Davis. Hodges, thanks for coming on on the channel and talking to me about life after ankle replacement. Uh, glad to be here, Nick, and uh, love that you're reaching out and making this kind of material more accessible to both our patients and our colleagues. Yep. I think, you know, I, when I started thinking about how to talk about ankle replacement. One of the questions that always comes up is what to expect. And we have a lot of experience, I think, with the hip and knee world in terms of activity. And I think we have a lot of patients could talk to friends and family members and hear who's had a hip or knee replacement. But ankle replacement is a little bit less common. And I still get people come in and say, I didn't even know you could replace the ankle. You know, it's become more common since I was a fellow with you. And, and I think the patients have changed a little bit. You know, I think back, I can remember one of the fusions we did. And I think the guy was in his 30s. Yeah. They were not so convinced that now he wouldn't have gotten a replacement if he saw you. Or at least like have that, have a little bit more serious discussion on that. What do you think? Well, no, there's no doubt that the evolution, I did my first replacement in the um, in late 90s, and the evolution has been phenomenal. Not just um, the growth of the number of procedures, but our understanding of what we need in order to get longevity with, with an ankle replacement, as well as what it can do to patients' lives and how it can be an advantage over an ankle fusion, which was, which was the only option for end-stage ankle arthritis when I was a fellow and early on in my, uh, in my practice. Yeah. Yeah. It's changed a lot for sure. I wanted to show this case because I just saw this patient like last week. And this is, I think, you know, hopefully I can say this. I might have to edit this out. This gentleman suffers from tall white man disease as Hodges used to call it, but you know, a male patient, late fifties, otherwise healthy, works in healthcare. So he's educated. He knows about his options. And what I, the first thing that I thought was so interesting about this particular case was when he came in, he said, I already saw one of your colleagues uh, across town and he told me he, th he thinks I need a fusion. And, you know, when I first, and this was a, somebody that I trust, I respect. I think he's very, very thoughtful. And I think what gets confusing now is patients are hearing different things from different surgeons. Because to be honest, I looked at this and I was like, I think I would replace it. Unless you tell me I'm wrong, then we're going to have to cut this podcast really short. But that's that was kind of my initial thought. Yeah, he has some varus deformity. He looks like a guy who's probably sprained his ankle a bunch. I tend to tell patients this is a post-traumatic arthritis problem. But this is not an uncommon story or a scenario, is it? No. In fact, this is this is more common than anything. Most most of these folks, tall guys, are played basketball or football and sprain their ankle and continue to sprain their ankle after their playing days are over, whether they were high school, college, or professional. And this recurring ankle sprains that develops into an erosive type of varus deformity is very common. In addition, the other things you see is you've got this recurring calcifications in the, um, in the lateral gutters at the end of the fibula, as well as calcifications on the medial side, which tell me that, um, that this has happened multiple times and the body has tried to do something to add some stability by, by laying down these calcifications. And all of these scare people away from replacements. Uh, but for me, that gives me comfort because I, I really think that this is a this is a fairly straightforward replacement. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit then. Let's go down the road of activity and expectations with each one maybe. You know, if the you know maybe he says, "Well, I just I really trust what that doctor told me and so now I'm thinking maybe I just want to have a fusion." And we've talked about this before where a well-done fusion can actually get you a lot of mileage on this. But but how do you counsel patients when they come in? They're asking about the differences between a replacement and a fusion and activities and expectations after each one. Well, in varus, with most often has a camovarus foot also. So that's the reason why he's got recurring ankle instability. These are the ones, in my opinion, functionally do the worst with fusions because their foot is already stiff. So now you're going to make their ankle terminally stiff. It's really difficult to get this eroded varus ankle into into neutral it is. or even the valgus. 
I think that's a hard fusion to do. Yes. Ideally, in someone this age, you'd want to do an arthroscopic fusion. And I think that it becomes very difficult yeah. to get this aligned correctly. And so now all of a sudden you've got a stiff ankle by nature of the fusion, and you've got stiff foot by the nature of the, these types of deformities. And they're the ones that do the worst with, with fusions. The yeah. ideal fusion is one who has a normal hind foot motion. And you can see, even on these x-rays, some very mild arthritis in the posterior aspect of the subtalar joint, yeah. which, which then makes this less ideal for a fusion. That's right. That being said, I caution my patients with fusions because if you wear out the subtalar joint, then you're going to be stuck with, with having to stiffen up the subtalar joint, which then makes it, makes it worse. And what I found early on in my practice is I would do a fusion and patients would do pretty well for five, six years, and then they would get arthritis in the other joints. And now you're faced with, with fusing those joints. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, creating a very stiff foot in someone who already has stiff feet. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because that was the exact kind of discussion we had. And your point on if you're really going to get him the best chance that if he decides to go with a fusion, the best chance, I think in this case, you've got to get that into slight valgus to unlock the hind foot as much as you can. You got to do a fin osteotomy probably to realistically yeah. do that. And now you've kind of burned some bridges down the road as well from an option for fusion or for replacement if you want to go back down that road. Can't really walk that back very well. What about now? So the thing that's interesting also about this gentleman is he was running six months ago, which is pretty incredible. Actually, you know, that he was able to run on this because, you know, it's been like this for a minute. And he came in and he said, you know, I've kind of already gone through the grieving process that my days of running are probably over, which I'm grateful for. But what, what are, you, are the expectations? It's saying you can snap your finger, you jump ahead, you've got the replacement done, and, you, and they're, they're three months, four months, six months down the road. They want to get back to activities. What do you tell them that they can do realistically in terms of their expectations after a replacement? So I, I always caution my patients to stay away from repetitive pounding. So that's running, but I believe they can walk as much as they want in any any form. I let my patients play doubles tennis. I tried to keep them away from singles tennis. The doubles pickleball, that was something that, that I did not have a problem with. Snow skiing, I, I really had more problem with, with snowboarding because mm. there's a chance of hyperdorsiflexion, which you don't have in snow skiing. Um, and then after that, I think patients are going to do what they're going to do. It's it's pretty interesting that the data that's coming out about about sport return to sports, patients are are getting back to sport much better with replacement than with than with fusions. I would probably keep them away from basketball. Hmm. I would encourage them to do stuff that doesn't require that that amount of stopping and starting. But I I don't think I have a huge amount of data other than, than patients that tend to do better are the ones that take care of this implant. Yeah. Yeah. The long-term expectations, I think, are sometimes hard to know. You know, somebody who's in their late late 50s, early 60s is going to have at least another 20 years of, of life expectancy on this. And, and, and they're going to be active. They're going to be using it. They want to be active. You want them to be active. So things like hiking, what about pickleball? How are you landing on pickleball? I mean, that's uh, that's that's interesting because now you're seeing people come forward. Maybe they see it more in the hip and knee arthroplasty world where they're like, I'm actually fine with my knees, but I want to play pickleball, so I want my knee replaced. I think you're going to start, start, start to see the same thing in some other other yeah. conditions as well. We'll think, how do you land on that? No, I think pickleball is, is fine. Doubles pickleball, I play it, so I, so I kind of know what the requirements are. It's a bunch of short movements. We are seeing that uptick in Achilles ruptures, which I think is the, is, is the more that pickleball players tend to, tend to be more deconditioned than tennis players. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that's the reason that we're seeing Achilles ruptures. So, um, but I mean, for years I've been playing fairly regular pickleball with one of my total ankle patients and, um, and every time she walks on the court, I, I look at her, you're limping a little bit. Oh, no, that's my, you're retired <laughs> now, so I can't, yeah. <laughs> you can say things like that, right? That's right, right. What? Let's take expectations. So how would you set expectations for this patient in terms of, you know, I know we talked about what they can get back to, but 
maybe it's another thing to feeling up to it, to getting back to those things. How do you, how do you have that co conversation? Well, I mean, you know, my, the reason that, that we love ankle replacement surgery is our patients are so measurable and they get so much better. The Delta is, is pretty substantial. So in, in, in these folks, I tell them you're going to feel really good. And I always say anything you want to do walking, you can do, you can walk the golf course, you can, you can walk for exercise, you can walk to do whatever you want. And then the other things it's, it's, you know, how you do and how you feel. And I always, always tell them also that most often the failures are in the first two years. And so, mm -hmm. so, and unrelated to activity, whether it's infection or whether it's, it's early subsidence of the tibia. And so I always say, look, before you go back to the activity that you really want to do, give me two years. And if they make it to two years, mm. our experience was that if you make it to two years, you're going to make it to 15 years. Oh, that's great. That's really yeah. good advice. That's a, that's helpful. Cause then, and that's valuable to be able to tell the patient preoperatively too, when you're having the conversation, then they know, okay, two years, I can get back to the walking. And then if I feeling good, I can push it from there. That's, that's really, really good. Yeah. And the, and the data really supports that. Our study out of Ortho Carolina, but HSS just published another study and they, these are with fourth generation implants. So I, I feel pretty good that that, that mm -hmm. is, that's the deal.